on it. What happened to it? My mother-in-law stole it to look at beetles and bugs, and I never got it back. <laughs> Take three. Take three. Four. Cool. I hear you still. Cool. Are you back to yeah. two parenting? Yeah. Back to back to two parenting. That's nice. Yeah, it's curious. The solo was kind of <laughs> kind of easier, strangely. But there's more children now, so it kind of makes sense. There's a ba- there's a baby again. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> no, it was good. We had a great time. Uh, Laura's back from her artist camp. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's good. Kiddo's a bit sick, but... Nice. Oh, good. It was entertaining right. having them crash the party on the last recording. Entertaining in hindsight. <laughs> Quite traumatic yeah. at the time, but um, right, it's, it's stressful in the moment. <laughs> um, I'm always mm. shocked at how loud my dog is in person. We're walking around at my house, but then like you usually can't hear her unless she's barking on the recording. And I was noticed. like, how is that possible? Like it is so loud in person. It's like a little tap dancing horse. <laughs> I, yeah. How are you? Good. Went on our first trip with just about one year old. Never been on a plane before, which it's a bit early, early for flying, I suppose, but we just did it. And especially, I don't know if it's the same over there, but like flying with a kid under two, as long as they're on your lap is free. Mm. So you just pay the penalty of, of <laughs> <laughs> dealing with your under two year old on your lap. Yeah. <laughs> But he did great, better than kids around us that were older and younger than nice him. Nice model child, that's what we want. Iron had thought out a lot of good little, like, endless snacks and mm-hmm. little toys to play with. Like, they're basically like fidget spinners that, that suction cup to things. <laughs> and he just loved that. All these little stupid, like, $1 toys that, like, he'd never seen before. So yeah. it would last about 10 minutes and then, all right, need something else. Cycle something else in. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, how, how have things been for you? Uh, good. Be, I've, I've still been machinist. Johnny's back home now, but he hasn't been. Mm. He got in yesterday, so he'll be back at work next week. Yep. So I think that's week five of his absence. And kind of this week felt that the most, I reckon. Like I didn't really get off. The machines, I don't think I sent a single quote this week, which is bad for cash flow. And right. we haven't had many sales through the website. So, yeah, it was, you know, it was a pretty fun week. Got through a lot, but I was pretty stuck out on the floor. And, yeah, chopping stuff, programming stuff. Yeah. Sort of refining my workflow for my, like, drawing shelves in Rhino instead of Fusion. Still enjoying that. Yeah. Kind of getting a few systems set up. Um, it's like using Rhino for like assembly and organization. And I feel like it's always felt better for that to me than, I don't know. Fusion's good at single tracked thinking and creation and being able to modify that over time, I guess. Yeah. And come back and like have, I don't even know, sometimes fast iteration, but sometimes chaos iteration. <laughs> chaos, yeah. Both. Made me think of something. I um, remember that DXF thing we were talking about yeah. where Ma- a client of mine was trying to, I, f- I found, I found an easier version. It, I just, you know, I don't know if you do this every once in a while. I'm either looking for something like, cause I have two computers I always am like misremembering that I haven't installed a plugin on one or the other, or like for some reason I don't have it installed somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I got to go get parameter IO or whatever it is. And I was, yeah, I'm always like, oh, what else is in the app store for Fusion? I found a DXF for laser plugin, and it seems to, well, I haven't tried it yet. Its examples are make dead simple outputs of DXFs from objects i think it's mostly based on cool. silhouette but it 
looks fantastic compared to even map boards, I think, because map boards has a lot more mm. inputs needed probably to create simple outputs. So fantastic. I will link Please it. Please share. Mm -hmm. I had a customer submit TXS for cutting the other day, and I had to kind of remind myself what to do with them. Like, I'm so used to programming step files or, you know, right. native fusion bodies. I was like, what do I do again? Because they'd done it in, like, what used to be gold standard, having all the layers separated with, like, this is engraved, this is a pocket in different colors on different DXF layers, which is awesome when you're programming in something like OnRoot or VCarve or whatever those 2D ones but I was like oh yeah. I'm gonna have to like extrude this and then cut your features back into it just to be able to program it how I'm used to like I could probably hack my way through it with tool paths off the 2d profiles in yep. fusion and risk having them on the wrong side of things and stuff like that but hmm, it's curious so I have I've had similar you know I mean that's just a common we've never done job shop work outside of using Fusion, mm. like that's been our our, law, our common forever. But I mean, I, in my career, I've used lots of 2D files. And what I always think about in terms of, let's say requirements or requesting from clients is I feel like a, a 3D file, and I've heard other people say this, like there's no questions. If you've made it accurately, it is its own check and maybe that's because of how good Fusion is at simulation that you can do like a simulation compare and then it's like, if I'm not cutting it, it's not showing accurately. But maybe that's, you know, I was just talking to a friend who was asking me if 2D files would have been easier for some of the parts they cut. Mm -hmm. We used to cut for them all the time and now they've moved and they're using kind of a, a mutual friend to do CNC work. And it's like, I was like, well, I know they use the other company use VCarve, like, but we we never did. And to me, there's so much left in relying on layers mm. to translate that information that I just feel like you'd make so many mistakes. I would make so many mistakes like that. Maybe that's just how I make things. I don't know. Oh, well, it's definitely harder to verify. Like, you know, when we used to cut open desk components. They had like really fantastic files, 2D files. Oh, God. Beautiful, right. beautiful layer yeah. separation, beautiful color coding, good layer, like naming conventions and stuff like that. But you really just had to trust, like you apply tool paths based on the layer name and trust that it was right and could trust it because yep. they did good file prep. Yeah. No way of verifying or, simu or truly simulating what the result was going to be, which is, yeah, obviously so different to what we're used to with Fusion. It's funny you bring up OpenDesk. We looked at, I looked at said, you know, being a vendor at one point, mm. and yeah, right. I was honestly really turned off by the way that the files worked. Really? And how many different variations there oh, were. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's the same thing. I think it's because I'm used to this 3D model thing, and I'm like, I don't want to interpret how your layers work for how the, I don't know. Maybe it's, I just am very visual, so. 3D models always have worked great for me. Oh, versus that, like it'd be impossible to do that. Trying to remember in my head how a data works versus this other part, and yeah, I mean their system was anyway. definitely not intended to be programmed via something like Fusion at all. Like that would have been a pain. <laughs> that would have been a massive pain to try and do that through Fusion. Do you do you still do it that way? No, we, we don't have Enroute installed on any machines anymore, so we can't program it. Sometimes I kind of wish we still had a copy of it lying around, but we just don't. The last OpenDesk product that we still occasionally make, we have our own Fusion, parametric Fusion model of it that Josh made a few years ago. So we can treat it, oh, treat nice. it normally and update dimensions and machine it how we used to. Yeah. Right. And I remember I hassled OpenDesk for a while saying, oh, when are the Fusion models coming? Come on, guys. And that was around the time they went out of business. So, yeah, no Fusion models. Oh, they went out of business? Well, I mean, were they a business? Oh, yeah. 
An organization, I guess? Yeah, they're an organization. They seem, I didn't realize that. Yeah, they seem to... Uh-oh. Go dark for a while there, although they've made a return recently. I'm not sure what's going on. Dark task. <laughs> um, yeah. I, uh... I pulled off a multi-year casual desire to... We have Nakwal in two walls of my office. One was, like, on my left. There's kind of the original version, which we just kind of did on a whim as an experiment. And it has still, honestly, it's crazy. It's the first version we ever did. And it's basically the standard, but we did, like, full panels. So it fits the wall just perfectly. The spacing is all the same. Uh, like, nothing changed, shockingly enough, that we can't move stuff around the shop on it or not. And then the ones behind me are what we were trying to sell as like a product and never actually got there. But I always had this thought as like, well, I've got these mounting points. I kind of want to lay down in here once in a while. And this, <laughs> this floor is too dirty for that. So I finally got a cheap uh, hammock and strung it up between the two. And it's, you can't really stay up all the time, but it's pretty nice. It's pretty good. <laughs> Very appealing. I've always wanted a little day bed at work. A bunk. I've always joked about putting beds in the pallet racking for naps. Right. I've never been one to nap. Like, I just can't chill and, like, lay down. But, like, sometimes I just, like, want to lay back and think or something. And, I, you know, there's just no place in a shop typically. So, it's been mm. nice. Awesome. I um, got sent a, a bill, I got sent an invoice a couple of nights ago for like $13,000 out of the blue. And I was like, and it was from um, Vividworks, our kit parts configurator provider. I just went back saying, yeah. what is this and why did you send it to me? And they're like, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. Let's let us cancel that for you. Thank you. But it made me um, oh, sh mistake. It's just think like you know that it's not coming around yet. But I think early next, early to me, yeah, like March, February, March or something. Our sort of twelve month commitment to the VividWorks platform will roll around, and I noticed a tab open in Chrome as I was sitting on the couch last night. It's like, oh, that's right, the little GeoCities DIY. Kit Parts configurator, I really should keep just chipping away at that so there's not like, so I know by the like the end of the year whether it's actually viable to do a DIY solution or not. Right. So I opened up, you know, Sim Theory, got a coding agent going and started fiddling with the code again. Pretty immediate, immediately ran into that roadblock right. that we've discussed of like the code block's a bit big trying to isolate and find errors and then recompile it is tricky. Yep. So it's like, oh, I know there's apps now that like plug straight into VS Code where you can kind of work with your code more natively. Let me have a quick look at that. So I jumped out and downloaded Kodi, which just had a free plan and installed it in VS Code. And like immediately it was like, oh, wow, this is way better. Like I can can highlight a bit of code, I can speak to that context only. And then yeah. I was working with right. a sonnet initially and it provides, you know, provides comments or ideas on how to change it and then you can accept or reject or keep chatting until you're happy with the solution and then you, it'll, it rewrites the code in context, obviously the correct formatting without any sort of compiling issues and stuff. And it's only working That's on that amazing. little bit of it that you're playing with at the time. So immediately... A and great it's solution. Free? There's a free tier. I mean, I ran into what's it called? Like rate limits. Oh, pretty oh god. Pretty quickly. Two hundred chat messages or commands per month. That's like half a day. Yeah. <laughs> Not even half a day. Yeah. yeah. No, it was <laughs> but it's nice. Um, yeah. Ran into some ten bucks for unlimited though. Yeah, that's right. So I pretty quickly last night I changed to the unlimited plan, which is still pretty well priced and. Um, just kept chipping away at it. And it's, yeah, it was immediately better. And I ran into a couple of situations where it wasn't, its solution wasn't recompiling properly. At which point I just took the whole code back yeah. to Sim Theory and dumped it in and said, hey, this isn't working. 
because sim theory can see right yeah it's got the screen capture so i was kind of using both no, that's, concurrently that's what's great about that so i had sim theory looking visually at the configurator that i was making saying hey this is the problem can you just tell my i was, I was using a language can you t write a prompt for my engineer as to how to fix that and then i was taking that prompt over to cody dumping that in and then it was solving it beautifully so kind of yep. working with both concurrently anyway got to a point last night with a few you know some some new buttons new feature there's like an undo feature now which is awesome so you can like undo as many steps backward as you want in terms of what you build and clear the canvas and in sim theory jam 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 where did he go well that was so weird i'm back that was so weird <laughs> you, you froze <laughs> and that's gone and then then the screen like was just sitting frozen then when it finally woke up you disappeared and the lighting had changed it was like time it was like it was a different day it is what do you mean <laughs> shut up <laughs> no wonder i'm cold um, you were, <laughs> you, it's a wall. you froze as you were asking, is sim theory something, something, something. Oh, you were saying undo. Yeah. And I was asking in sim theory. Yeah. Right. In the configurator. Yeah. That is nice. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. In, in your configurator. Yeah. Drag and drop. Undo. Yeah. Did you know you got to do like, I know you're trying to build it yourself, which is cool. I have uh, recently just gone through a Fiverr experience having somebody consult yeah. on some design work and it was very affordable and it just reminds me of like, I, I've heard people, Saunders and Grimsmo and other people talk about it all the time, but it's like, there's a lot of talented people out there oh, hell yeah. that want to work uh, that you might find somebody you can at least collaborate on with yeah that's going to cost you if you just amortize your cost of and not that i don't know i mean it sucks to have spent that money but you did test out the theory i guess to know that it, there's the certain amount of cost that you're paying now isn't worth what what the return is for now anyway like with your uh, vivid works yeah look, relationship I, i'm really um, happy with the product and we've sold plenty of units through the configurator right. but yeah it is quite a high monthly cost and so to justify that we'd need to be right. doing more product which obviously we want to do anyway we want to sell more product but um honestly it's partly just yeah. the speed and usability of it like there's something about this 2d version yeah, that's, that's just it's, it's so easy and snappy to do like people still have trouble yeah with the 3d one and I think partly because it is a bit laggy as they're yep. clicking through. It's like it can be a bit confusing as to how to get it to do what you want it to do. Anyway, but yeah, right. like when before, you know, whenever that was, ages ago, before I went with VividWorks, I tried, I, a year or so. I uploaded some briefs to Fiverr or Upwork or whatever those platforms oh, are. Oh, yeah, you did, yeah, yeah. And I guess before I had a working example of it, it was quite hard to communicate what I needed it to be. Like now that I've got this like GeoCities version, it'd be way easier to brief someone right. and say, hey, look, here's an example of the, the functionality of what I need it to do. Go and make it properly using the right code basis so it's going to work well. <laughs> like this is what it needs to do. Like right. here's a functional example. Whereas that was very hard to communicate previously. Right. And I, you know, the briefs, I didn't have much luck with the briefs that I posted on those platforms at the time. Sure. Mm. That's a good point. But I mean, you, yeah, I mean, it seems completely feasible that if it's a, maybe you've already thought of this, I'm just encouraging mm. it, I guess, that the, well, let's go back to, it's like you were developing this configurator that you have now under a different business model, basically. True. I was. Back where the costs and the, the overhead and all the things were different that it's like totally fair for you to rethink the like ongoing costs. Mm. I mean, maybe there's just a, a conversation too to have with, with Vividworks and just say like, hey, this has been great. It's really slow. 
and uh, it's too costly for yeah. what it's converting as, what can we do? You know, like, and just see if either one can, like, can they, from what I understand, like, they, they might just need to spin up another AWS server closer to you, yeah. which is kind of crazy that it's, they don't have one. And then, I mean, but the world evolving as it is with making apps and such, like being a premium solution is great, but also like maybe they should reconsider that, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. That's a good point. Know. Not that you'll convince them, but... I don't know. Never know. Yep. But you have time now to like continue the project as your own thing. And I do agree. It's like the one you had is cool, but the 2D thing works just as well, mm. you know, in a lot of senses. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Related to this, mm. I had this thought to try out one of these little tools that I've seen people use before. And I, I, I was, as a curiosity, and I had a suspicion that it would be um, high engagement, I guess. Mm. But I've posted these tilting carts before a few times. This is a, the video I posted was like two years old. And I just sped it up and made it a little more contemporary cut out some fluff in what I was doing. And then I did this, if you've seen these before, like comment to DM automations. And at first I thought I could do it with Zapier and you can't, you can't do DMs with, with Zap, Zapier, Zapier. And so I was kind of stumbling around asking GPT and the one that kept coming up was this thing called mini chat. I linked it to, but they've got this locked down. There's a free version. You can pay for it. Oh. And it, it's gotten so many engagements. And the reason I bring it up is not the like, oh, everybody's going to want to do this weird influencer thing where they like get people to like go download my course. You know, like I feel like that's what it gets used for the most or like you, comment. You have courses, uh, Justin. Coupon me and you'll get a coupon in your Instagram DM. Yeah. But yeah, like yeah. I was basically just offering people the easier way to get this link to this cart that yeah. I get nothing from it. I was an experiment, but I've had so many people do it for my normal engagement. And I think it helps in the engagement algorithm too. Mm. Like it's creating a lot, you know, more circulation. And so I bring it up because I was thinking that this might be good for you to link out the configurator link somehow. Mm, I see. I see. Yeah. Cool. Because people maybe aren't getting there. Uh, from seeing you play with it or whatever you do, but like basically you could just put in a keyword and when people comment the keyword, it automatic you can do this little engagement mm, cool. pipeline that's kind of reminds me of, it's just a little like connected chart of uh, things that happen. And yep. basically you can do a bunch of steps or just like one and then they get a DM and you've created a conversation too, which I think is pretty valuable with probably what you're trying to do is like you can have it say like well uh, let us know if you have any questions and you're creating this like instant engagement of like a sales process i think yeah um, right. cool anyway so any oh, any nice. comment on a post becomes a dm play basically with. a comment with a keyword with is the way keyword. i have it set yeah, up okay. so i have if you said cart anywhere in your in your comment yeah. on the vi specific video you can also do it on stories you can pick specific or like all posts and then it automates them getting a DM as a comment reply, which is cool. Cool. Okay. And it's been wholly 100% positive. Nobody has said any, like, oh, this is weird or spammy. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, my God, thanks. This is amazing. Yeah. Cool. I'll check it out. Thanks. I've done that before, but very, very manually. Just me copying and pasting responses. <laughs> Which works too. True. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Old text expander. Cool. Cool. Yeah, baby. cool. We got questions. That's an interesting birdie noise. Uh huh. Or is it chicken or something dying? It's. Trying to play, so I think it's. Gotta hope that comes through. I think it's a black cock or two, maybe. <laughs> Oh, I, I sent this to you, but I'll have to share an image of this. In we went to Costa Rica, and they have five-inch long, roughly grasshoppers, maybe 120 millimeters. Amazing. There that 
sound like birds. Oh, really? And I was like, oh, Australia's got to have something like this. And I, and I sent it to Jim, and he's like, no, those are terrifying. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. It's ginormous. Yeah, it's cool. Like one landed on my brother, and it, he like had like a full body, like, oh, God, <laughs> what is this? It's just like got pretty hefty little grippers and like... Control. Yeah, they're kind of terrifyingly large. They look big enough to carry away a small child. Or a few of them could gang up and carry away a small child. Yeah, we, we watched the children closely, <laughs> right? If they weren't completely idiotic. <laughs> I see we have some questions. We do. This is from before my trip. and They came in after we did the show, so. Thanks. Um, yes. Bunch of them. Cool. Shall we? JK Table Co. asked if, had a couple questions, do you have a separate phone line for the business, whole phone, or just an app to add it to your phone? And uh, my answer is, I think we have different answers, but uh, we have separate Google Voice numbers, and uh, you're probably well aware from listening to the show that I am not a phone-centric business. We do almost all of our stuff through email, but when needed, we do have a separate phone number which does work as a voicemail as well. And you can pay for it in your Google workspace if you have Google set up, and it's pretty expensive. So the secret is just create a Gmail that's separate, and it's free. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Google Voice is not available in Australia. What is that? Does it just route to your phone? What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, I guess you'd call it like voice over IP, if that's the right thing. But like you, it, there's an app, you can get it on the browser. Your phone has an app, just a Google Voice app. And then it can like ring to your phone. You can call out from it. And then there's these little devices, a little, little puck that you can plug into a landline phone here. And it connects to a network cable, and it turns that phone into a phone number that's Google, there you Google go. Voice for free. Cool. It's kind of crazy that it works. Was I'm assuming someday it'll disappear. I can't believe it's happened and not been sunset after this many years. Yeah, I was just looking at that. It sounds like it's fairly unsupported, but uh, cool. There you go. Hmm. I this, this answer may shock you, Americans, but I use my personal mobile. And that is all. My personal number is what's listed on the website and in Google. Someone could Google like butter and call me, which works honestly really well. And I have no issues with it. Yeah. What was, sure. what was that podcast we used to listen to? Reply All. The I got this. Oh, I got the yeah. sense listening to Reply All years ago that. Your mobile numbers in the US are like more susceptible to fraud somehow. Like if someone has your mobile number, they can kind of do dodginess with it, which doesn't do you seem get to a be a thing. Do spam calls, first of all, like Very, to your numbers? Not that many. And I'm pretty good at telling oh my God, if they're spammy just... or not. I'm just not right. answering. Um, yeah. There's a lot of spam. There's a lot of text message crap, especially because of the election lately. It was like five a day. These stupid links trying to get you to either pay the political party yeah. or a, a, a fake thing. But I don't really know exactly how prevalent it is. I'm sure it's still pretty prevalent, but there's this thing called like SIM hacking or SIM jacking, mm -hmm. I believe, where the little card and identity could be like basically stolen and a lot of it just ends up being through your telephone provider and tricking the customer support person to think that you're you're them and yeah. you want to transfer it to somewhere else, yeah. which is just ridiculous. I don't know that that has any correlation to whether you use it for your business line or not. I don't know. It, it just, could happen you know, probably in any circumstance. Sometimes I think it would be nice if right. my personal number that I've had since I was 18 wasn't listed. Like it seems a little bit risky to just have that 
published everywhere as the business right. number, but it's incredibly convenient, like being able to text clients from my laptop through iMessage and FaceTime and switched calls and like it's just all very native and easy. Um, yeah. It works well for me. Yeah. There's a lot of tools now for the, like, like, I don't use any of them. They're fairly, I'd say, costly for what I'm looking for usually, where you can create secondary numbers and use that to text through, like, a website app uh, or call with kind of virtual numbers to use. Kind of like Google Voice, where it's, like, all virtual, but you can, like, use it for a business sense. Like, I know my wife's different companies she's worked for for architecture. They have these same kind of virtual numbers and like their email gets their voicemails and they can like yeah. call up to it from their yeah. phone and through their computer. So it's, it exists. I don't know. We don't, I don't use any of that. And I mean, I guess we're a good representation of two different use cases of like, we don't really use phones here and you do. So yeah. yeah. Cool. Personally, I would like it to be separate. I'm pretty, I don't want, I like a ch separation of church and state of business, <laughs> but you know, whatever. Cool. I don't think there's a good answer. I think it's like what you want it to be in my, my take. Yeah. I think that's um, a good, I'm probably stupid for not engaging it more personally, but cool. JK table co has a second question. That's along something we talked about today already, but hiring help or professionals, <laughs> CPA, marketing, website, et cetera. And I guess my first thought is I should have been doing this a long time ago. I have a friend that has a very successful consumer product brand. You know of it, I'm sure. And they have been, he, he was just really smart in the beginning and he was outsourcing and like contracting through Fiverr and Upwork and friends that he knew that could do or do different types of either graphic design or engineering work and like it's obvious that that's the way to grow a small business mm -hmm. to me like because you're not committing to paying a salary in most cases but still getting high quality results and leveraging like what you're good at hopefully which is mm -hmm. like i don't know exactly what you do necessarily but i'm not good at accounting i've always hired accountants but I don't, I guess I should probably do it for more things, honestly. Yeah, I'm pretty bad at outsourcing. I've got a good accountant that I like, trust. That's honestly about it at the moment. I've dabbled in outsourcing marketing in the past. And now I just don't do any marketing. Website, although I've always tried to do myself. Although we had Jay on our team for number of years who was a front-end web developer and very skilled and that was awesome having someone with those skills on the team but i've certainly never been interested in outsourcing something like web yeah all the fingers yeah. in all the pies uh, well i guess i'm curious if any of you hire or outsource or contract different i guess i see it as like task-based things it's not like an ongoing like well it could be ongoing but i just mean like maybe more project-based, like what are, how has that been successful? I'd love to know kind of hmm. more examples because I can't ever seem to commit to doing it more often for myself. Let's see. Debris Brooms. Custodian. What, when is Justin going to buy up Gems Fryer? Any other non-traditional tools in the shop? <laughs> I don't need a fryer. It's not a competition. I don't uh, need a fryer, Debris Brooms. You need a pizza oven. <laughs> uh, that's not not inaccurate uh, the thing i have been considering is powder coating still i still <laughs> feel like that's in our future someday cool so tired of dealing with poor powder coating solutions oh yeah it comes back to insourcing everything right do it do it yourself it's which is the opposite of <laughs> outsourcing <laughs> we we're just talking about uh, depends on the thing Depends on the thing. We thought about selling some equipment that we're not using. We haven't used our edge sander in production for ages. I didn't realize how little it was being used, but yeah, it basically is not being used at all. And it's a 
beefy bit of kit. Takes up some space. Right. I think it was about $6,000 new. Anyway, I haven't looked into it, but Woo! I should really look at getting rid of it, freeing up some cashola and space. I mean, every time we consider, you know, to me, it's like any time I could can bring in another type of CNC type machine, I want to do that versus a manual type machine. And, you know, the conversation has been maybe a lathe someday and the conversation continues to be get rid of more woodworking equipment. You know, we barely use the planer joiner that we bought that we replaced two separate pieces with. And it's like, I don't know. It's not really being used that much. Yeah. Like we could get a smaller table saw. None of those machines are making us much money. Yeah. They are not producing a final product versus a lathe that can automate you know, bar stock into final products like that is what a hundred times more valuable, <laughs> probably more. Yeah, a little bit more costly than a a joint to planer, but you know, I get your point. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, non traditional tools. I don't know what else do we have. Uh, not many. Pretty traditional, I guess. You'll just have to come and visit. I'm sure you have a few. Just oh, come, yes. come for a shop tour sometime, you know. Skip over Agreed. here. I feel like he's got a lot more, but they're all like purpose built for his his broom making, but mm. there's a lot of things I've never seen before coming into his Likewise. shop. Very cool. Very cool shop. Check him out on the Instagrams. Mm -hmm. Um Mark oh, trust me to get the to get the surname that I can't pronounce. Mark with a French surname. Um, oh, yeah. De Mon That's like mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should be able to say it. You're French, That's my security right? password. Yeah. Say my last name. <laughs> how much looking back at how long things actually took, like cam or cutting, do you actually do? If you do, how do you do it? Mm. We don't do any anymore. But we used to do it a lot, probably too much. <laughs> Same. Um, Same. We used to spend Ugh. a lot of energy and time across the whole team, time tracking every single minute of mm -hmm. every day, every job, inputting all those jobs into zero right. projects to ensure that they were there for the team to track them. Huge amount of data, which I've got tucked away somewhere. And I'm not to say that that was a waste of time, but we no longer do it. And part of the reason we no longer do it is because we learned a lot from doing it. And so now I trust That's true. that yeah. that data at the time, well, you know, that data was fed back, not all of it. There was way too much of it, but a lot of certain, we would cherry pick data and we would feed it into our system. So like our quoting calculator is built from data from time tracking. And when we downsized the business, that just felt like something that was arduous and unnecessary with such a small team. And I also knew that I had all this data that I relied on historically and can can refer to if I need to, but basically I've built the systems off the back of it and now trust those systems. So now we don't do any and God, it is, yeah. not, it is nice not to time track. Like it is so... Right. freeing and probably terrible for my brain like there was the advantage of having that focus of like i am doing this task now i'm going to stay on this task because i'm time tracking it and i'm not going to skip around yep but that's probably the only downside i can think of right now yeah we stopped in the pandemic it's just kind of a same same story but i just honestly felt like things have to be as lean as possible mm. Which, you know, I think in a lean sense, that's probably the wrong answer. But I, we still yeah, learned a lot of lessons from it. None of the systems we ever used were very foolproof. They always had a lot of, like, the more automatic time tracking can be the better, in my opinion. Not always great. I mean, you know, like, it helps you be more aware of what you're doing. And it mm -hmm. helps me stay on task for what I'm trying to accomplish, usually. Yep. And I started doing all that myself before I had employees. And then 
I still think there's a, a huge virtue when you're learning or doing a new thing. Like we do, we still do time studies, let's say. We don't, I don't know if we call them that so, so specifically, but it's largely around like, man, when we would do like 80 sheet jobs, we, we started out at, I want to say like 30 minute cycles and we caught that down to like 10 or 12, like all together, sheet, sheet on yeah. a table, parts off, clean the table, new sheet on between change of the cam, automating some, you know, like pop-up pins and moving carts around. So it's like all these little things that I think are very much lean principles are helped significantly by even like a, a, a sectioned off version of time tracking, like per project or something like that. And the way I still do it is I added a debrief field to our projects in Airtable. And so mm. whenever we're finishing up the project, if there's something really notable, like this kind of chamfering took us absolutely forever. Don't do it again, change this thing. And so you could honestly just scroll through the debriefs and learn a lot or like maybe point an AI at that and say, what are we doing wrong all the time? That's cool. Um, and I also use that for when I go back to quota job again for especially the, the same client. I will look back at something we did, especially if it's a repeat thing, like, oh, mm -hmm. man, we lost a bunch of time on this thing. It's almost always negative things, yeah. which is fine. Just like trying to keep track to not do it again. That's cool. I like. I really like that idea of a debrief field because it's so easy for that to be lost yeah. to a certain person on the team who does or doesn't remember a detail of a job. Yeah. Or I find my anecdotally, like as the owner, my sort of corporate memory seems to be the strongest in terms of remembering details of clients oh, or yeah. jobs, which makes sense, you know. <laughs> Sometimes right. I'm surprised by right. it of like, why do I remember that and you don't? But I think it's just an owner thing of like you're across more details and you you have to remember this stuff. But I love that but, debrief idea. That's cool. I would say that I find Ricky will have, he's he's not one to criticize or complain at all, but I we've always had a strong, I think, culture of feedback cycles of like he's not going to typically put it out there but i'm always asking how do we do this better right like i think that's a good mm. whoever's managing or in charge you have to constantly be asking that it's part of what we try to teach in our cnc unicorn class is like i think this is more and more common but i always kind of preface it by saying like industry-wide this is not common this was not common to have the people programming and the people running the job weren't collaborating so much as almost like at odds with each other. And in my take, it's like everybody's completing the same job. So we're all responsible. So I'm always going out and asking him, even on like our own projects, like, is there any waste in this? Like, can we cut out any cycles or things that you don't, you know, I'm using like weird corporate language here, but it's like anything crappy about this, you know, like, can we change anything? And he'll then usually if he hasn't noticed, watch for those things. And mm -hmm. then he's like, I don't know, you could probably take some time off that chamfer. It's picking up too high or like. Yeah, yeah nice. That's anyway, cool. We're going a little on and on about this, but. No, it's good. That's cool. What about CNC cut Melbourne asked any tips to check if a used tool is sharp or blunt to track tool usage in any way? Lee. Thanks, Lee. I used to have a microscope inspired by the Bomb Johns. He used to keep a microscope in the shop with yep, a little yep, yep. screen on it. What happened to it? My mother-in-law stole it to look at beetles and bugs, and I never got it back. <laughs> Etch. <laughs> Woo. Look, it was cool. It was curiosity. It was interesting to look at a few tools and go, oh, wow, yeah, look at that chipping and blah, blah, blah. But honestly, it's just reading the cut. You know, I feel like plywood is very transparent in terms of it, it telling you the condition of your tools. And, Interesting. And it's just reading the results off the table. We don't do, you know, we don't really do any formal tool inspection. It's just like 
as as the quality drops off on the parts, we're like, cool, let's swap that tool out or let's get that tool sharpened. Yeah. And we don't track it per se. Right. Do you have a way to do that with your tool, your machines? No. No, no, yeah, no, our, no tool tracking. Uh, I think a lot of routers don't have the capability. I would assume that you'd need like a Fnook or like a a proper control to be able to track on a router. Our mill technically can. It is messy. Is it? Mm -hmm. And I think it's it would be really valuable with like a product based thing to be able to track that, but we don't. I I will take I'll do the other side of this. I think that a low cost microscope is pretty invaluable, particularly the same way that something like a torque wrench is, where there's a lot of subjectivity in the quality of a cut. I think especially with newer employees or people that aren't doing kind of like a QA type thing. So that it's hard to necessarily justify tossing a tool out sometimes, especially when they cost a hundred some dollars, you know, some of the ones we use. So a, I just linked us like a $70 microscope is we keep it by where we set up tools. It's a piece of crap. I actually might replace it because it's got a tiny screen and like the lights went out on it like immediately. <laughs> but I mean, I guess it's gotten us through a couple of years worth of use and even how crappy it is, it is amazing. Like just yesterday, we were cutting tool forks and the sidewall was a little bit rough. And I said to Ricky, I was like, man, this is getting a little rough. You should check the tool. He grabs the tool out of the spindle, pops that microscope on in like eight seconds and looks. And he's like, yep, there's chips, mm. chips in the tool. And then you, there's no question. Like you can't see these things with your eye. Obviously, you can see the parts sometimes, but I don't know. I think it's really valuable. For how cheap it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It, That's how we tell. Cool things. I just looked in Google Drive and Johnny does have like a tool tracking spreadsheet for the main tools in the tool changes oh, on the yeah. two s machines of like when tool one was last replaced and then some conditional formatting so it goes red if it's, you know, past three months. But it looks like that was one of the systems that sort of fell by the wayside when... Uh, with the downsize because it doesn't look like it's been updated since the start of the year. No time for tracking. No tool tracking, no time tracking. I do like that idea though. Like we did informally on the pencil sharpener in the tool table because it's got a tool table because it's a, when I used to change tools mm. in the in the Masso. I used to put a little note in the tool table saying sub spindle threading tool was changed on this date. Because, you know, there's only four nice. tools in it and it's running production parts. It feels like that's really valuable. And same like with your forks. Like I feel like no, yeah. something like that where you're running your own small fiddly part that doesn't get any post-processing. Yep. It's not like it's going off and getting edge sanded, like which almost all of our parts do. <laughs> like you're trying to make a finished part, then I feel like that's super, no, it's, su it's super valuable. it's literally done yeah. once it's off the machine. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. It literally takes us like almost a day to set that up and get it dialed in. And I'm sure if I would move it to the mill, it would be smoother, but it's just, it really feels like an ideal, it's right on the edge, right? Like we're, we're getting the most out of this machine that we can still, where we're trying to get thousandths of an inch tolerance and it's a little tough to dial in the just all aspects of it, like the tool setter is just not very accurate. So uh, it works, but it takes too long still. But mm -hmm. I think some of those things like, especially in like a seedle, it's like those tools just last forever. Yeah. Like you yeah. can just cut and cut and cut. Cool bananas. Ba, 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 ba. You make me want a microscope again. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think the only other news from my end is that we have, officially kicked off the PS2 project again. Pencil sharpener version 2. Ooh, maybe. Export edition is back in development this week and that's exciting. So yeah. More news on that soon. Yeah, it's good to be back in there chatting to Ro who's helping drive that project. And yeah, it's going to be rad. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. 
I'm excited for that. Mm. <laughs> Beep up. Hmm. I want some coffee. Beep up. Give me the hair. coffee. Coffee. Yes. I guess I'll leave with. You want a complaint or a cool thing? Both. Give me. Go both. We got time. <laughs> in, in three minutes? Yeah. We probably <laughs> talked about this before, but I've been using this KPI tracker that's free, which is very like corporate jargony, but yeah. basically key performance indicator. Whoa. And I've been tracking for our retail business, the number of orders we get, the retail revenue, and how many new products we launch each month. And I just record them at the start of the next month. Oh. from Shopify and our product Airtable. And I think it's been pretty helpful to keep an eye on these things kind of as we continue. I'm sure I should add some others, but I would I would recommend. It's it's super manual. There's no like you just enter in data and it has charts. And I think it's just nice cuz I'll like share those with Ricky and I think it's you know, the charts are going up, so it's morale boosting. It's Okay, cool. It's just good to keep track of those things. Yeah, and awesome. Push your goals, I think. So free little tool I've used for two years now, maybe. And who's whipping you and holding you to account if you don't hit your KPIs, Justin? It used to be mentor that I was working with for a while, and we just kind of stopped working together. I don't feel like it kind of reached the end of the usefulness. So mm -hmm. I've, I've been thinking about getting a new mentor lately. Nobody, myself, you. You. No, I'm not. I'm happy to be that person, but I don't feel like I do a very good job of it. <laughs> so is that the complaint? Or was that the cool thing? Oh, no, the complaint is that damn jet bandsaw we bought is, <laughs> I want to say just trash at this point. It We've replaced parts. Now it seems like there might be a gearbox issue. And they're like setting up some, I don't know what it means, but it's taken forever to get in touch with Jet. They're like, they asked us if the if the blade was going the right way and if we were feeding too fast. And I was like, get f***ed, man. Like, <laughs> yes, your thing Beep. is not working. We know how a damn bandsaw works. It really pissed me off. And I, I told Ricky, I screenshot, I said, this is a good reminder to not treat your customers like idiots. Mm. Like, expect them to know what they're doing. Totally. And and it, oh, he also asked me if the phase was right. I was like, it's 110 single phase. It is running the right direction. I'm very, very sure of that. Like, it was working fine, and then it stopped working, basically. So, anyway, we got... 10 seconds. 12 Quick. seconds. Hi. Ready. Thanks. Set. Thanks for questions. Bye. Bye. Fine. I'll do it myself.